Thanks for watching this demonstration on carbon black protection. Before we go into showing you an actual live attack and how our product responds to that attack, just want to go over a little bit of high level architecture. Our product is a client server model. So with that being said, we do deploy out agents to all of your endpoints that are talking back to a backend server that's going to be doing all the heavy lifting for us. That is a Windows 2012 R2 server. You can host this virtually or physically on premise. You also have the capability to host this through a cloud platform of your responsibility through Azure or AWS. The idea of how Carbon Black Protection works is that we have a list of trusted execution. And when anything outside of that list of trust is executed, uh, you will see one of three things happen. In a low enforcement, the end user will just be able to run that executable. We will report only. This is good for when we first deploy out to your endpoints so that we can determine a baseline of what runs in your organization Monday through Friday. In a medium level of enforcement, if the end user goes ahead and attempts to run something off that that's outside of that trusted list, they get a prompt that says, hey, we don't typically approve this type of application. Are you sure you want to run it? And they can go ahead and decide. In a high level of enforcement, the end user does not get that option. So they will go ahead and get a block message. They do have the capability though to put through an approval request through which they can go ahead and submit that. And for any point of sale machines, SCADA environments, servers, that block message can act in a stealth mode, doesn't need to necessarily show up. So we're gonna walk you through, I'm sure plenty of you have been through this situation, your end user goes ahead, uh, they download something that they shouldn't have, and even if they're intelligent enough to recognize that, it's probably too late. Now what we'll notice is from a back-end perspective, the kind of effect that this particular attack can have. Once I gain access to your endpoints, the idea is I want to get a feeling for where I am, right? I might rerun IP config, I might try to kill off some processes. We do offer tamper protection with our product to ensure we stay up and running at all times. From here, I'll just check to see who's been logged in and then drop their hashes so that I can go forward with best credentials possible. Now once I've moved on, uh, now it's all about figuring out what are my next steps? How much damage can I do? How much Bitcoin can I charge you with encrypting your file database? And while I try to decide these next steps, I'm going to sit myself in the recycle bin. Nice way for me to be able to lay low here. Now what we'll notice is that if this attack tried to fire off in a high enforcement posture, remember, if it's not on our trusted list, it is not going to run. Notice the difference. So as this attempts to migrate up to a high enforcement server, we see this block message. What's important to know is with our protection product, we're not blocking the PDF because we know it's bad. We do have the capability to block known bad based off the largest AV repository out there, but outside of that known bad, right, how are you going to prevent those new variants of ransomware or new advanced persistent threats? Well, that's where we come in. The idea is those things are going to try to execute, and especially with this example, not part of our trusted list. Documents shouldn't be executing, so the idea is not doesn't meet our trust, going to get this blocked. As I mentioned before, this block message doesn't have to necessarily pop up, but we do offer you customizable logo and tags. So the typical question we get is how are we creating this list of trust? The nice thing is when we actually deploy out to your endpoints, we will take an initial inventory of everything that runs on them and send that back to our server so that you don't have to go through that manual process, we'll have those already available to you. And then we'll start going through these vectors, starting with updaters. Anything that needs to be updated without meeting a block message could be your default browser, and things that you guys are building your software off of or deploying software. We wanna make sure those things can run without issue. 
Moving over to publishers, this is all of the certificates in your environment. We will collect these, including any self-sign, and send those back for you to be able to approve. We can also trust directories. So what we're saying here is if it's an, a local drive or even we can talk about network drives, as long as the end user goes to this location, they can pull what they need. We'll talk a little later as well about how we can protect what actually gets placed into these drives. Now we can also approve files, memory, registry, or scripts, but how can we make this manageable going forward just to ensure to maybe future proof what your employers are, are going to want to bring in going forward? The idea is we have the capability to say if it does not meet our pre-approved criteria, it just needs to meet this trust score of eight or greater. And if it does that, no problem, it's going to be able to run. That score is taken down from our Threat Intel Cloud. Uh, you'll notice here we have an executable, and with all executables, we ping off of our cloud database to see if there is a score between 1, 0 to 10 that is associated with it. In this case, we see it's zero trust. Now, we don't just give you a score, we give you that background check. So things like scan results, right? What are we seeing from commodity malware vendors out there. We can also tell you if it's part of things like ISOs or in this case NSATools.zip. We can also give you sources for where your things are dropping from typically. So it's a really nice way to be able to see overall what we think of this executable and if it will automatically be allowed for your end users to run. If it does not meet that pre-approved criteria, we also have the capability to detonate. We use various detonation tools here. The idea is we can just say detonate to CV file analysis. We offer this uh, sandboxing tool for you. It is an additional cost. The only thing I'll talk about today that's outside of the licensing for CV protection. And the idea is we'll go ahead and detonate files up to our file analysis. If it comes back as clean, automatically approve it. But if it comes back as malicious, go ahead and automatically ban it. So we do a lot of the vetting up front for you, but now let's talk about the few things that are off the map, right? They're not going to be able to be detonated or they're just not part of that list of trust. The end user gets the block, but what's nice is that they can go ahead and put an approval request, submit this up and you're organization gets to decide how they hear about this. Maybe through a ticketing system email relay message that we send it through. We also might just send it right up to someone's specific email. And the idea is, once I see exactly what they're looking to use, I have the decision to make. I can approve it locally, give it to this sole individual. I can approve it globally, give it to everyone. Or maybe I approve by Active Directory policies. So this goes to servers, but it's not going to go to POS machines. That's really how CB protection operates with its application control. So now let's talk about some other functionality that you can add in down the line or right away. One of the key pieces that we do offer is file integrity monitoring and control. So if you have certain places or use tools that can monitor rights to files or folders, we can do that. We can also block that change. So if I go in, and in this case, we have it set up to block changes to customer account info. This is great to use on uh, boot folders, on POS machines, great to use for any sort of Windows file share server. Uh, the idea is if I try to write over this data, I will be blocked. Or let's just say that this is a folder that you would rather not get hit with ransomware. Typically, the idea of ransomware is to go in, delete your original files, replace them with encrypted ones. Well, that's not going to work here. We will block that. The great thing about all this activity is that we do log this in the backend server so that you can pull a report that will show any attempt to go in and change this information was blocked 
We'll also tell you who attempted to edit that information and the source through which they attempted to do so. All reports of execution in your environment can be exported to CSV or we can send them out to a log aggregator of your choice. Another thing to mention is that we do offer uh, the idea of off-network protection. So, if for any reason your servers or fixed function devices do go offline at any time, we do offer that disconnected level of prevention. And you decide. You can either maintain that level, heighten it, or lower it. Overall, we're going to be with you no matter where you go. Last thing to note is we do work uh, with device control, the, giving you the capability to block writes to unapproved devices, report reads from them, and block execution. Whenever a device is plugged in, we will report down to you the serial number. We're also going to give you information as to where that device has been plugged in and if it's currently attached. So overall, that's Carbon Black Protection. Please reach out uh, to anyone to get more information here, but thank you for watching.